Why, hello there. Guess who read more than one book this month, in the month of June? I read. <laughs> I finished some books. It happened. And so we are going to do a proper wrap up. Um, it's very exciting. I haven't done this in a long time. <laughs> um, let me start off with the easiest thing to talk about. I read uh, the last two books in the series L'Ombre du Chardon by Akishi Mazaki. Um, I read the Kinoto and then finished off the series with Mai Mai. Um, Akishi Mazaki is a Japanese author, but she actually lives in Canada and she writes in French. So these are not translated works. These are in the original language of French. And as far as I'm aware, they have not been translated into English. But um, I really like this series because it's, it's quite clever in the sense that it follows... Um, there's basically like a main sort of like not not as much as an event but just an occurrence a basic life occurrence and each book focuses on a different person as they um sort of interact with that occurrence so for example the first book our um our person had uh, had an affair and um had decided to go back to his wife. And then the, the second book followed the perspective of the mistress. The, uh, the third book followed the perspective of the man who introduced the original guy to the mistress. And then this book followed uh, the wife. This book followed the wife's perspective. And then this book followed um, another perspective that were introduced uh, later. So it's really interesting because it's one of those situations where like, you you might have read a book and you might have thought to yourself what did the side characters really feel about what has happened other than what the author has been able to reveal which is usually um, a re reveal that can only be done when the character is in the same room as the protagonist so this series what's really creative about it is that it shows you what's going on with the side characters without the protagonist having anything to do with it. And it kind of just follows the before and the after of a particular situation, which in this case was the affair. And they're all linked by this common thread where each book is named after a very, um, uh, I don't need to say traditional, just basically named after a Japanese flower. And the L'Ombre du Chardon uh, title, uh, make sense once you read all five books. And I also had to look up what, the, what a Chardon is. I wasn't familiar with what kind of plant that was, but it all made sense uh, once I read the entire series, which is really pleasant. Now, the way the series ends, for me, kind of a strange direction. It, it I, I, I have to admit, I'm not really sure um, how I feel about it, but I have to understand and accept that th these things could happen. Um, they have happened before, I'm sure, somewhere in the universe. And so just because it's not something that I would generally accept in my own lifestyle and accept within my, you know, circle of, of my circle, um, I don't know. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. And the book with the wife too felt, I have, I have to say it felt a little forced. I was, it, it, it felt a little bit unnatural, probably because the pacing of what occurs is way too quick. And it just seems too convenient, to be honest, for me. I was like, well, that's that happened without any problem. Like, it, it felt too, it felt a little bit hallmark, I'll say. Maybe that's the right word. It felt a little bit too hallmark for me. Like, that's not really how the situation is going to play out in real life. But in any case, I really like the idea of this of the series. And I have um, already on my TBR her other series, which is the uh, Okuro du Yamato uh, series. So I have that one and I will be reading that next time I decided to um, read Akishi Mazaki. So I really enjoyed that, even if the ending was kind of like, mm, that's convenient. <laughs> All right. Then the next book that I finished, or actually didn't, I'm not going over these in order, but the next book in my pile that I finish is the play Lucide by Pierre Corneille. Um, this is my second play to read in French, uh, either last year or the two years before. I read Cyrano de Bergerac. 
by Edmond Rostand, which is a very, very famous French humoristic play. Uh, and I really enjoyed the experience. Now, Cyrano de Bergerac, the whole reason I read the play was because I loved the movie, the Gérard uh, Depardieu movie, which um, basically all the dialogue is from the play. So you're basically watching the play when you watch the movie, but it's in live action and that makes it much more well, fun for me. I do like uh, theater and live action, like the Romeo and Juliet, all those movies. I really, really love those. I really just think uh, the movie really is very good at bringing out uh, plays. So, but yeah, upon reading Cyrano de Bergerac and really enjoying the experience, I wanted to delve deeper into French theater. Um, and then I kind of just wanted to see, because the thing is like, you know, I'll talk to my family and they'll make references to certain things I don't know. And it's true that because I didn't grow up in France, I didn't get to read these kind of books in school. So this is now my chance to catch up and see what everyone, like what my cousins had to read. Um, although my cousins are not very literary people, so I'm sure they didn't enjoy anything of the sort. <laughs> but in any case, so Lucide Pierre Corneille is a play from the 1600s and it takes place in medieval Spain. And basically what happens is that uh, there's Don uh, Rodrigue and there's Chimen and they are in love with one another. But uh, Don, uh, Don Rodrigue's father has been offended by Chimène's father and uh, Don Rodrigue's father because of this offense tells his son to avenge him and so Don Rodrigue ends up killing uh, the father of Chimène and so then the rest of this the play is basically Chimène's uh, reaction to that and her deciding to go after Don Rodrigue to basically have him prosecuted uh, because she has to avenge her own father now. So it's a tale of vengeance, it's a tale of um, sort of familial obligation, fatherly love, uh, but also just love between two people who have been uh, broken apart by a really serious thing. It's, it's a, a play about duty and obligation and I really, really, um, really enjoyed this. It's very simple. Um, even even the, the the dialogue is quite simple. It's it's in rhyme, so every paired lines are in uh, are rhymed together. Sometimes on certain occasions, and it, it's usually to bring out a different effect. A, a different effect. The first and fourth line will rhyme, and the second and third word will rhyme. But everything is in rhyme. So if to just to read. Um, just to read uh, two, well, four lines basically. Au sein de ces sujets, un roi doit la justice. Pour la juste vengeance, il n'est point de supplice. Levez-vous l'un et l'autre et parlez à loisir. Chimène, je prends part à votre déplaisir. So, yeah, it's, it's just that kind of rhyme. So it, it's not super fancy. I would say Shakespeare is a lot more fancy. Shakespeare has a lot more playful play of words, things like that. It's not the level of Shakespeare, but the rhyme definitely works to push the pace of the play forward and to really, really let you have fun um, with the interaction between all of the characters. So that was really fun. I really enjoyed it. And it was really gripping because you know, this is my first experience, not only reading this play, but just in general, having any sort of um, interaction with this play. I wasn't familiar with this at all. So it was exciting for me to know, does it end as a tragedy? Is it, do they get a happy ending? And I really enjoyed the way it goes because it's, it really could go either way. You actually don't know. So I thought that was really interesting and really, really fun. And I'm looking forward to the next play I read. And then it'll be fun to um, talk to people like my grandmother and see if she's, I'm sure she's familiar whether or not she still remembers the play, but it'll be nice to talk to her about it. So then the major update was I finally finished Empire of the Summer Moon, which is a nonfiction about Quanah Parker and the rise and fall of the Comanches, the most powerful Indian tribe in American history. Now this didn't take a while because I, it was difficult or because I didn't like it. No, it took a while because I was lazy. <laughs> I was super lazy. I didn't read for like two, three weeks or I didn't read this for two or three weeks. One of those situations where you put a book down and you get distracted by everything else or you just let your mental state say, you know what, we're just not going to read today. It's just not going to happen. So, but it did eventually happen. And I finished this just in the nick of time. And 
it was really, it was really, really, really so good. Um, this is as pretty much as the title says. It's it's the history of the rise and fall of the Comanches, and that part absolutely fantastic. I really, really enjoyed it. It's less Quanta Parker. Um, Quanta Parker comes into the later third of the book, so I would say the book is split in like three parts. You have the first third, which is really the rise of the Comanches. Um, it's showing how strong they were. It's showing how uh, the the whites were. Uh, starting to push on the Texas frontier. It also goes over a little bit of um, Comanches always ha also having to deal with Mexicans and things like that. Then the second third, um, we deal with uh, Cynthia Ann Parker, who is the mother of Quana Parker. Uh, the, she was a, a white, she was kidnapped uh, when she was like about nine years old. She was a white child, she was kidnapped and she was raised as a Comanche Indian herself. And she was raised to the point where she forgot English. She forgot English, and when she was brought back into white society, she didn't want to be there. She wanted to be with Comanches, and so did it. So the second third really deals with the heartbreak of that, and basically the inability of white, uh, of the white population to accept the fact that not everyone wants to be in a European lifestyle. Basically, uh, no one, not everyone wants to be white. Basically, so. Uh, that was sort of the, the, the second third and then the third part briefly deals with Quanta Parker. Quanta Parker is not the main focus of this book. The focus is the Comanches as a whole. Um, and I really, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I think the author was very good at uh, commenting on the fact that Indian history is very much whitewashed uh, history. He also uh, very much points out the fact that it's hard to really um, come up with a history for all these Indian tribes because they tend to not write journals. Uh, they tend not to leave any sort of history other than a verbal history. And obviously what happens many times with verbal, verbal history is that history turns into myth, uh, which means things get exaggerated or they get um, put into a spiritual perspe perspective or things like that. So you can't really get actual facts from these sort of uh, stories. Um, so most of the uh, evidence for everything in this book does come from white people and their experiences with the Comanches, um, their observations, um, if they were kidnapped by the Comanches themselves, uh, their observations when they were within the tribe and what they got to see. So it's definitely a lot of that. And the, uh, the author, I think, is very good about explaining that and really showing that, that. he's also very good at injecting humor every once in a while in the sense that you know really criticizing the whole the whole whitewashed aspects of everything and then also very um he's very quite funny when he points out like how prude white the the whites were um there was this wonderful paragraph where he explains the name of this one Comanche Indian and he says oh but that's actually not his name because his original name um in the Comanche language would be an erection that never goes soft and he's like but obviously the whites changed his name to a different they created a nickname because they were most obviously too prudish to um be able to say such such a horrible thing so there's there, there's a lot of humor injected but you definitely also get the horrors of of this timeline both uh, the violence from the Comanche side but the violence from the white side and just basically the 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 utter devastation that this um, interaction just created, basically, um, and not not uh, you know there's fault from both sides. There's definitely fault from both sides. Now the Comanches um, might not have had to do as much as they did had it not been the white people uh, constantly uh, encroaching onto their uh, territory, but we can't ignore the fact that the Comanches were also quite vicious with other Indian tribes. So, I mean, they were known for being, um, again, very powerful and but quite violent. Um, but I do think the author is very good at portraying both sides. Now, I've read a few, few um, reviews criticizing the author's use of the words of, well, basically, let's just begin, Indian, savages, uh, brutal people, or I don't know. He, he uses some words. Uh, to be honest, these kind of words don't um don't uh really stand out to me as much not because um you know i'm not 
capable of seeing the problem, uh, how certain words can be problematic. That's not the case. Uh, the thing though is that I think these words were used appropriately for the situation. Now, we're talking about history, so we're not looking at the treatment of Native Americans, the indigenous population, um, in modern society where these words should not be used. You're not, not going to go to an indigenous person of, of uh, America and call them a savage. No, you're, you're going to be a bigot. Um, but when the author is talking about the white perspective or talking from the white perspective on the American uh, West frontier, and then he uses the word savages to describe the Comanche Indians, that, that makes sense because when you're trying to discuss the, uh, the horrific things that the white people did to the Comanche Indians and what they thought about the Comanche Indians um, and how they dealt with the Comanche Indians, you're, they're not going to be like, oh, these native, native people are really bad. No, they're, they're going to call them savages and they're going to call them uh, reds and they're going to use all those kind of um, those words that we wouldn't use in modern society. But it makes sense in the context of the book. So that's, for me, those kind of criticisms um, fall flat for me. They do fall flat. Now, uh, could you make criticisms about the scholarly level of the book? Uh, perhaps, but I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert in this field, so I can't make any sort of uh, commentary, commentary on that aspect of the book. What I can make a commentary of is the ease of reading, the uh, ability to hook you, the ability to really um, discuss both sides and the, the feelings of both sides, but really choosing, um, but showing like the, the respect of the Comanche Indians and what they had to deal with at this time period. And I think that was really quite good. I do believe there's a little bit of repetition, especially towards the beginning, um, just because every time the author would introduce like maybe um, another uh, person who is quite important to this history. So for example, um, when he describes the Parker history, uh, the Parker family, the, the family of Cynthia and Parker and Quanta Parker um, before they were murdered, but like their interaction with the Comanche Indians or maybe some Texas Rangers and their interaction, uh, white frontiersmen and their interaction. And so whenever he has these new players in the game interacting with Comanche Indians, he does go over their perspective and their um, experience with these, which causes repetition. For example, the constant saying of, oh, and the Comanche Indians at this point were quite known for being incredible horsemen because they had etc, etc, etc. Or now they had all the, the, the Colt revolvers, so now they were, not only were they equipped with powerful horses and their uh, mastery of uh, uh, riding a horse, I can't think of the word right now, but they were also equipped with guns. So like that kind of thing does get repetitive a little bit re repetitive at times, but I think all of that kind of smooths out as you get towards the end of the book. Other than that, um, the only thing I would have appreciated um, in the book, and I always think um, is common with a lot of nonfiction books, is more maps. So there is a map of Texas in terms of what Texas looked like between 1836 and 1875, uh, but in the book he does a lot of times talk about how um, oh, now they were in this city, which is now close to the modern city of, you know, Amarillo or things like that. And I think what would have been good would have been, a bit, would have, been to have two maps, the map of Texas uh, during 1836, 1875, and then right next to it, a map of modern Texas with a little bit of Oklahoma um, and New Mexico just to really get you um, to be able to compare how Texas has changed. Because for me, being from Texas myself, obviously I know what all these... Um, cities are from or the majority there were a few I wasn't aware of but um, for the most part you know I'm very familiar with the Texas landscape so I know what the author is referring to but if someone from Massachusetts were maybe reading this uh, nonfiction book they might struggle to really be able to visualize the, the like the vast territory that the Comanche Indians were able to um, to travel just on horseback it's really really absolutely fascinating but yeah I was utterly utterly engrossed in this book I really really enjoyed it um, <clears throat> S.E. Gwen. So this, this, um, this was actually published before the other nonfiction I read, which was the cult, uh, the cult of blood, uh, cult, blood cult, 
Cult of Glory, apologies, Cult of Glory, which is a nonfiction about the Texas Rangers and how they aren't really the good guys as they're often portrayed in media. Um, and But it turns out this came first and the other Cult of Glory came after it. So I did a little bit of comparison, bit, comparison between the two books and Cult of Glory actually references this. So it's good to know that you're reading nonfiction and things and they're connected um, and being reference, referencing or uh, they're being referenced because that shows there's a level of respect and correctness um, that's associated with the nonfiction. So yeah, I really, really love this. This was fantastic. Essie Gwynn. So oh, at the very end of the last pages, there's a... Um, um, a insert or sorry an excerpt from his new book hymns of the republic which seems to be about abraham lincoln i don't know if i'll read that for some reason like uh, for some reason like history about the american presidents doesn't isn't really triggering a desire out of me that like yeah i think i want to read that so we'll see but i definitely think i'd be more interested since he would be the author of the book and I thought he was very good. So yeah, super excited. I read that. That was a real, real um, gem of a read. Like I need, I need more history like that. I love fictional, uh, not fictional, uh, narrative history like that. I think it's just, it really just helps really bring a, a landscape um, to life. Even if you were already familiar with it, it, with a lot of it. So for me, definitely all the, um, it was actually amazing like he would mention like a lot of other Indian uh, well, now Native American it's hard to know what term to use when you're referring to uh, history but um, I should use Native American I think and I don't know even now I think the term has changed but um, but yeah just the, the all the Indian tribes that occurred that were uh, sorry in existence at the time and being able to recognize all the names which are names I haven't you know read since like elementary school and middle school so that was really fun and really interesting because American history is obviously fascinating and what the um, Indians had to, to go through is absolutely just brutal and, and, and unfortunate. So yeah, really, really super interesting. Um, and then I just uh, finished the the month. I read the first volume of Love Hina by um, Akamatsu Ken. Uh, this is a very, very famous um, shonen, uh, harem manga from back in the days. Uh, this was the very first volume. Apparently it was published in 1999. So this is definitely an era of uh, manga that I absolutely, absolutely love. And um, yeah, I've been looking, I've been, after I finished you, actually, I, I had been looking through my shelves and trying to find, you know, what's the next read? What, you know, what do I, what, what am I feeling? And I had tried um, a few options, but wasn't really getting into something, but I picked this and I'm like, okay, this, this is the moment to read this. And yeah, so I was able to read the first volume and I'm really, really, really excited about that. And uh, it was just really fun. It's like, it's exactly kind of what I wanted. Something, something lighthearted, silly, but you know, interesting, fun, a little sexy and not a good way, but like still it, good. I don't know. Like it's, it's really fun. So this is the manga I've decided I'm going to read it next. Um, there are about, I would say maybe like 15 or so volume. So um the the plan is basically right now when you're watching this video i will actually be on vacation in france so i have one week before i leave for france with the first week of june and i think i'm just going to read manga that week i'm not going to read any books i'm just going to read manga and so and then in in france i won't obviously i won't bring the manga with me so um, I'll start reading it again when i come back so that's kind of the idea with love hina so i'm expecting to be reading this through like uh, maybe until the end of august seems like a um realistic timeline so yeah in any case uh i'm so happy i finally finished some books read some books in the month of june <sighs> feels good it feels good like yes i do enjoy reading <laughs> um and i can i do know how to finish a book so yeah um that's it for today thank you so much for watching and i will see you in my next video bye